This video will be on articulating the leg bones of the chicken. Here's a brief recap of the various parts of the chicken legs. Let's start with the tarsal metatarsus and the first metatarsus. This video shows you the articulation process for the right leg. At the back of the tarsal metatarsus and right above the three metatarsi, you can see a small region that's lumpy and contains tiny nodules. This is where the first metatarsus or MT1 or the first digit would articulate to. The first metatarsus has an irregular shape but with a smooth groove on one side that's kind of S-shaped when viewed from an angle. This grooved side will cling on to the lumpy nodular region on the tarsal metatarsus. Once you're done gluing the two together, we move on to articulating the digits of the feet. I'll be showing you the articulation for the right foot. Before that, a quick look again at the tarsal metatarsus. At one end of the tarsal metatarsus, right below the first metatarsus that we have previously articulated, there are three distinct bulges. Two of them lie closer to each other by having a narrower gap between them compared to the other. This is the second metatarsus or MT2 or the second digit followed by the third or MT3 or third digit and then the fourth or MT4 or the fourth digit. Okay, back to the phalangeals. So this is a basic layout of the phalanges of the first foot arranged in the order in which they are to be articulated. MT1 joins with two phalanges while MT4 has the largest number of phalanges connected to it. There are 14 phalangeal bones on each feet. The distal most phalanx of each of the four digits are pointed and curved and they are more commonly known as claw bones even though they are technically phalanges. So from here on, to make things simple, we shall refer to them as claw bones and not phalanges. We shall also segregate the 10 phalangeals into the first four phalanges or P1, the second three phalanges or P2, the third two phalanges or P3, and the fourth and last one phalanx called P4. Let's take a closer look at the 14 phalangeals and claw bones and try to figure out their pattern of arrangement in the digits of the feet. The four P1 phalangeals differ from the rest of the phalangeal bones in that, when viewed from a slightly slanting angle from the top, these four bones have well-rounded outlines at their points of articulation with the four metatarsi. The rest of the phalanges have sharp middle ridges. If you see from another angle, these ridges are actually the boundaries between two depressions on top of each phalanx that houses the two protrusions of the preceding phalanx to form a hinge type joint. I know that this is a very crude way of explaining how to differentiate the phalanges, but it worked best for me when I articulated them. So we now know that the four P1 bones have rounded outlines at their points of articulation with the four metatarsi. The largest P1 bone will articulate with MT3 and the longest of the remaining three P1 bones will join with MT2. The two P1 bones that remain are almost equal in length, but one of them is more slender than the other. This will be called the hallux and articulates with MT1. The last remaining P1 bone articulates with MT4, so we've got the first four phalangeals covered. Now to the three P2 bones. Of these three bones, the largest bone will articulate with the P1 bone that comes under MT1. The remaining pair of P2 bones are more or less equal in length, but one of them is more slender than the other, and that comes under P1 bone of the MT2. The last remaining P2 comes under P1 bone of MT4. We have now narrowed it down to three phalanges. A pair of P3 bones along with one P4 bone. Of these three bones, the largest one comes under the third digit of MT3. The shorter bone of the two remaining bones come under P2 of the fourth digit and is followed by the P4 bone. And now we move on to the claw bones. The largest of the four claw bones becomes the claw of the third digit. The longest and most slender of the remaining three claw bones becomes the claw of the fourth digit. Of the two claw bones that remain, one of them is slightly more slender than the other and that becomes the claw of the second digit, thus making the stouter claw the claw of the first digit. 
The finished right foot along with the tarsal metatarsus looks like this. Now we move on to articulating the tibia, hypotarsal sesamoid, and tarsal metatarsus. For a clearer perspective, here's a quick peek at these three bones already articulated of the right leg. That end of the tibia which articulates with the tarsal metatarsus has pulley-like circular structures separated by a deep groove. These are called the distal lateral tubercles and will face the front of the body. These tubercles extend all the way to the back, although less pronounced behind with the groove between them becoming less conspicuous. It's in one of these extensions, the one on the inner side to be exact, where the hypotarsal sesamoid would lie. The hypotarsal sesamoid is a roughly crescent-shaped piece of bone that's smooth on one side but rough and irregular on the other side. It tapers at one end and is broad at the other end. The broader end will face downwards. The smooth surface joins with the inner tubercle of the tibia as shown here. Make sure that the tibia bends forward at an angle on the tarsal metatarsus and also see to it that this area on the tarsal metatarsus and this area on the hypotarsal sesamoid fall onto each other. Also notice the hypotarsal ridge on the tarsal metatarsus is behind and not in front. Once you have glued them in place, glue the tarsal metatarsus with the tibia. Now we proceed to articulating the knee-mill crest onto the tibia. The knee-mill crest is an irregularly shaped piece of bone that sits near the top of the tibia and functions as a hinge joint for the femur and the tibia. Two concavities are present side by side on the knee-mill crest, which will house the two condyles of the femur. Below the two concavities is a shallow groove by which the knee-mill crest sits on the side close to the top part of the tibia. This is how the articulated knee-mill crest, femur, and tibia would appear. Glue the structures in position. Once it's been glued, proceed with the fibula. The fibula is supposed to be an elongated piece of bone several centimeters in length. However, with cold water maceration, I ended up with a very short fibula. The top part of the fibula is flattened and roughly triangular in shape. It gradually tapers down, forming a staff-like structure. The flattened, broader end of the fibula will lie on the side of the tibia, close to the knee-mill crest like so. Glue the fibula in position. Once that's been done, we move on to the patella. 
The patella, just like the knee male crest, is an irregularly shaped structure slightly elongated from side to side. It has a shallow concavity on one corner which fits on the inner condyle of the femur just above the knee crest like this. Glue the patella in position. This is how the articulated patella looks like. And here's the finished leg. In the next video that follows, we piece together each articulated part of the chicken body with the torso or rib cage, and finally end up with the entire articulated chicken skeleton. The link to that video is in the description below. Thanks for watching.